It's a warm September evening in 1988. I'm surrounded by more people than I've ever seen. I'm five years old, but I can see far sitting on my father's shoulders. We're in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, and I'm excited because we drove all the way to Tallinn from my little hometown on the other side of the country. But there's more. My mom and dad are really excited about something. People are singing. I'm singing too. My mom is holding my little brother, but she's crying. But I don't mind because I have a flag. That flag has been always hidden in the closet like a big secret and gotten me into trouble every time I tried to play with it. No trouble today, it seems, and I can stay up late. Best night ever. My five-year-old self doesn't know it, but I'm witnessing one of the most remarkable events in the history of my home country, the singing revolution. More than 300,000 people had gathered to Tallinn on that evening to literally sing their way to freedom from the Soviet occupation. The singing revolution has been named one of the most peaceful revolutions in the human history. The singing revolution took down the Iron Curtain three years after that evening. 27 years later, the same country is one of the most digitally advanced societies in our world and a pioneer for e-democracy and e-governance. Since my childhood, I have done many things that my parents didn't even dare to dream of behind the Iron Curtain. I started my first company when I was 16, and it was my late father, a man who grew up in the Soviet Union, who encouraged me that my idea deserves a journey to the patent office. His encouragement helped me to step beyond my personal borders. You know the feeling like you could do anything? Well, that's exactly how my dad made me feel, by just believing in me. But of the many things that my par parents couldn't do that I've enjoyed the most has been traveling. I have traveled to more than 40 countries and lived shorter or longer stints in several of them. Last year, I spent 143 days abroad, and my then three-year-old daughter had more flights in one month than I had within the first 20 years of my life. Many things have obviously changed during the past two decades for me, but not only due to the circumstance of my location, but because moving around is just so much easier for all of us humans. In a way, reflecting what Phil Knight said in his memoirs, the world was much bigger in 1962. Yes, the world is much smaller now. William Swing, the Director General of International Organization for Migration, says that every seventh person on the planet is a migrant today. We are living in the era of highest human mobility in the recorded history. Why is this happening? Let's look at one simple structure in our lives that has changed. Friendships. Once almost exclusively formed around our neighborhood, our school, our workplace, our grocery store have suddenly expanded thanks to global networks. Suddenly, instead of being connected because of our location, we are connected in the verticals of interest. My best friend can be sitting in Japan, India or the United States, and we are connected through our mutual interest. Our comfort zones have expanded globally because our people are everywhere and we are more comfortable to be anywhere. The world has become more fluid. Economist Michael Clements from the Center of Global Development claims that there's one simple policy that could make the world twice as rich as it is. Open borders. His colleague has even gone further. Economist Brian Kaplan and data scientist people like claim 
that the world of free movement would be 78 trillion dollars richer. It was the idea around the movement of people that sparked the inspiration for the company that I'm building. It was in Silicon Valley when I asked myself, why is change happening here? Why aren't Google and other gigantic powerhouses emerging from anywhere else on the planet? The answer, I realized, was knowledgeable people who are drawn to this location. So in this more fluid world, what if we take a person with knowledge and expertise to a place lacking that knowledge and expertise? Could that be the start of an actual change? Even Google was built by human beings, so potentially moving around knowledgeable people could help us build Silicon Valleys from anywhere in the world. In 2014, I started to work on that idea, and thus Jobatical, with a mission to distribute knowledge to the far-flung cities of the world, was born. Three years later, we are connecting talent from all over the world to organizations in 49 countries. But since the beginning of Chobatical, one of the most commonly asked questions I have got is, what about immigration? Because yes, talent is more open to move around for a career, and yes, talent shortage is a problem growingly for businesses all over the world, and yes, we could potentially solve that problem by just taking people to the places where the skills are needed, but the rules and regulations will not allow it. For a long time, I actually thought that policy is a problem created by politicians and bureaucrats. I thought that when an employer in Estonia wants to hire a highly skilled um, specialist and can get a work permit within 24 hours, but a company in Greece has to wait one year and even then most probably will not get the permit, then it's because the policymakers and politicians in Estonia have made better decisions. That's what I thought. Until one evening in February a year ago. I'm in warm and humid Kuala Lumpur. My, my colleagues and I, we are in our very favorite restaurant in the Yalon Alor area. This time, my little three-year-old daughter is with us. And we love this place because they have probably the best chicken wings on planet Earth. Those chicken wings alone are a reason to fly to Kuala Lumpur. Suddenly, I notice that my colleagues are looking at something behind me. Then I realize that everybody else in the restaurant is looking in that direction, too. I turn around, and what I see is my daughter hugging a little Muslim girl. They just stand there, what seemed like forever, holding each other. No borders, no fear of cultural difference, just two little humans finding joy in each other. Here I am in Malaysia, 5,000 miles from home, and I realized that borders and policy are not about politicians. They are the reflection of the borders in our heads. Those are the borders that keep us from pursuing our dreams because we are afraid we are not good enough. It is the fear that somebody who is good enough will take away what's ours. I realized that policy is just a mirror of self-doubt of its citizens. In my childhood, I have witnessed how one peaceful revolution can change the world and lives of people. How taking down isolation borders can bring a society from desperation and suffering to innovation and success. Now it is time for another peaceful revolution. And it is the revolution to take down our personal borders. Those are the borders that keep us from pursuing our dreams, and as a consequence, we limit others to pursue theirs. Those are the borders that are fueled by our self-doubt and fed by hate and xenophobia. Taking down our personal borders would be the most powerful policy change towards a collaborative and richer world. Just like me, as a five-year-old, about to witness a change. I ask you tonight, when you go home and you're thinking about a day, acknowledge that you, me, us, we are the border guards of our lives. And we are in control 
of a peaceful revolution towards a better world. And you can start that by just sitting down for a coffee with a person that, with whom you usually disagree, or plan a trip to a country that is uncomfortably too foreign. This could be the start of your revolution.